Well, hello everyone. This is Amber with Story Chasing, and today is 10 Minute Tuesday. 10 Minute Tuesday is when I gather your questions from the comments and my videos, and I try to answer as many questions as I possibly can in 10 minutes. All right, guys, let's get started. All right, here we go. 10 minutes up on the clock and let's go. The first question is from Tracy McCain and Tracy is asking, does YouTube take taxes out of your pay or do they 1099? YouTube is actually owned by Google and I get paid through Google AdSense ad revenue and it is 1099. So I just report all of my income on my income tax return. The next question is from Hope Franklin and Hope is saying, what do you do with Lily when you go shopping? Do you go to places you can take her with you? If it's too hot, do you keep the air running for her? I'm thinking about this kind of a lifestyle and she's ready for all the freedom. So what do I do with Lily when I go shopping? I always make sure no matter what, wherever I'm at, that obviously Lily is going to be comfortable in the car if the weather permits. If the weather does not permit, I either one, I don't go, or two, I take her in with me. So for instance, groceries. Walmart is a grocery store that I will frequent along the road. They're everywhere. They actually do have some good organic groceries, by the way, little tip. They'll usually allow her inside of a Walmart. Now, there has been the occasion where someone has said, you know, she can't come in, but I'm like, it's too hot outside. I cannot leave her in here and I need to get groceries. And they've been really nice about it. And I have like a little blanket that I put down in there for her and I put her in the cart. If it's too hot and I just need to run in somewhere really quickly and I'm going to be in and out like within minutes, usually less than six minutes, I will leave her in the car and I lock all the doors and I hit the remote button to turn the RV on. Um, it's just a remote start and I make sure that the AC is running like on full blast so that she has AC So I just go in and out very quickly lock everything down. So that's how I deal with it Otherwise, I don't feel comfortable leaving her in the van Even if it was a warm day and she might be comfortable in the van if I had all the windows open Like if she and I are in here together, I can leave all of the windows open, but I don't trust leaving her in here by herself with all the windows open where someone could potentially break in. And so I don't want that to happen. So it's either I don't do it or I take her with me or have to be in and out quickly. The next question is from Kathy in West Virginia and Kathy's asking if Lily is microchipped. Yes, she is. The next question is from Diamond Road. Do you do meetups? And I'm not sure if this is where I leave my question or not. So Diamond Road left this question on last Tuesday's 10 minute Tuesday. So yes, that's definitely where you leave the questions. Um, I do pull them from other videos, but it's a great place to leave the questions so I can gather them quickly. As far as doing meetups, hmm, well, so here's the thing with the meetups. I was doing them. I just don't feel it's safe for me um, unless I do it with maybe another YouTube creator, which has happened before. Um, I did one in Tampa, Florida recently, but I had to publish my location very publicly all over YouTube and I didn't feel comfortable to me. I had a lot of anxiety surrounding that because I've never done that before. My videos are always two to four weeks behind. So I do that for safety purposes. So people don't know where I'm at and they can't, you know, find me. I'm sure most people are pretty cool, but there's some people out there that are a little bit questionable. I just don't post it publicly. So right now I'm not doing meetups. The other reason is we've got the pandemic going on and I'm just trying to keep things safe. It, it makes it a little bit harder for sure because of the pandemic. Sorry, I know it sucks because um, I love meeting all of you guys, but I just unfortunately don't feel comfortable with it, um, especially given some things that have happened in the recent past. So uh, I just would prefer to only do it with, if I'm doing it with other YouTubers and we can feel safety in numbers and, and the public. So hopefully we'll be able to do that soon though. So the next question is from Sunflowers311. Um, how do you get your mail delivered when you're doing longer term boondocking? So like if you need your mail but have no address to send it to, and are there locations like certain stores or businesses that would accept a package from your escapees mail service? Donna um, asked a similar question. How do you get your mail when you're on the road long term? Uh, are there companies that handle it? which is best and basically how does it work. So um, I do have a video that I will link right up here that talks uh, very in depth about the subject matter and then my whole process. Um, check out that video, but I'll answer this uh, generally speaking here. So when I'm on the road and if I have a campground that I'm at and I know I'm gonna be there for a while, they'll usually accept my packages. So I'll just have escapees who handles my mail 
send it from Texas to the campground. If I don't have a campground, then I'll usually have it sent to a UPS store or a private mail center and then go pick up the package there. I always call ahead though to make sure that they are accepting packages, double check that their address is accurate that I have on the computer and ask them how much the charge is for shipping something there and receiving the package. It's typically about $5. I could have Escapee send my mail via USPS general delivery, which I've done quite a bit in the past, but I don't know what's going on with UPS, but the mail delivery service has been very spotty in the last year, year and a half. And so right now I just don't trust it. A lot of times I have very, very important things in there. So I typically will send it UPS three day, something like that, because it's a little bit more expensive, but it's the best option to be honest, to make sure that I get my mail delivered to me. If I'm doing Amazon, um, they have Amazon lockers all over the United States. Typically in larger cities, if it's a smaller city, they're gonna have what's called an Amazon counter, which is a business that actually accepts the packages for you. And all of that's on Amazon. You can find the lockers and the counters there. There's no charge to pick up the packages from the Amazon lockers or the counters. So that's always nice. The next question is from Elsie Johnston. Elsie says, what do you use for internet? Do you use a hotspot, a cell phone plan, any areas that you can't get to internet or phone service? So Elsie, I use two hotspots and I have a cell phone. So my cell phone has a hotspot on it that I can use up to a hundred gigs of data. Um, that's with AT&T. Then I have a third party AT&T hotspot. That's just a data plan. And then I also have a Verizon hotspot that is paid directly to Verizon and that's only a data plan as well. So I have quite a bit of plans here that really help me, but I will tell you I've needed them quite a bit in the past. The reason why I have so many is because I wanna make sure that I always have access to internet. My entire business is online and I need to make sure that I'm pretty much always connected. If Verizon doesn't work well in one area, AT&T usually works very well. Same thing holds to the opposite. AT&T may not be working very well, but Verizon will be working well. So I can interchange between the two. And that's worked very well for me in my four years on the road. There are places that I've been to who have no cell signal whatsoever. And typically I may be able to stay there for a couple of days as long as my work is caught up and then leave to go into a city and find cell service there or use Wi-Fi. That actually happened to me when I was in Yellowstone this last year. It said I had five bars on every single hotspot and my cell phone, but I could get no data whatsoever. And I think the problem was that there's just so many people there in Yellowstone over the summer. So I ended up having to go into Jackson Hole, the city that's there, it's a very, very popular city, and an urban camp for like three days and worked. <laughs> and I had a good cell signal there, it was not a problem. So it happens, you go into rural areas and sometimes you don't have service. The bars that are on your hotspots or your phones can be deceiving sometimes. So always do a speed test check. I have an app where I do a speed test. I think it's just speedtest.com you can go to and I do a speed test to see what my upload and download speeds are before I set up camp and make sure that I have a good cell connection so I can use my data plans. The next question is from Carol Stockman and she says, how reliable are the websites for searching for dispersed camping? Uh, they are usually very, very reliable. I haven't had too many issues with them. Uh, there is a chance sometimes that you'll get to a spot and it's been closed and it hasn't been marked closed on the actual app or the website yet. That's for Campendium and iOverlander. Those are the two that I use the most. The reason for that, we're seeing a little bit more of that this last year because of what's been going on with the pandemic. Some states and counties are opting to close certain areas off to decrease the amount of tourists that are coming into town. So it's a little bit problematic, um, but it hasn't been horrible. Just make sure you always have a couple of backup spots so that you can move on to the next spot should that spot not work out for you. So I highly suggest if you're gonna do BLM or National Forest and you get out there and it's closed, find an alternative backup that might be another BLM or National Forest. There's a good chance that if it's closed in one area and that other particular area is close by, it might also be closed. So your third option could be I know it sucks sometimes, but Cracker Barrel, Walmart, or urban camping. So check out those things. Um, or you can get creative and just pull open your Google satellite map and look around the area and see if there's a place for you to stealth camp. Depends on how big your rig is, but you can do that too. Also, I wanted to let you guys know, if you haven't heard, I have the Nomad Mentorship Bootcamp, which teaches you guys how to transfer from a sticks and bricks lifestyle into a nomadic lifestyle. And it's a whole mentorship program where I help you through the 
process. There's eight modules where you get to learn the entire process from beginning to end. And at the very end, you come out with a full action plan so you know exactly what you need to do in order to transition into this lifestyle. We also have this amazing community where we network, we talk, we throw ideas out, we talk about our concerns, our fears, and I'm able to get in there and help you guys in that area as well. All the students also help with each other. And then I also have live video calls where we get on a Zoom call and we just talk about anything that you guys wanna talk about to again, address concerns, fears. Sometimes I'll have guest speakers on there. So there's all kinds of really great information to help you transition into a nomadic life. If you're interested in taking the leap, go ahead and click the link below. And oh, by the way, you also have lifetime access. So no matter when you decide to move into a nomadic lifestyle, you can start learning now and really hone in on what your action plan is so you know exactly what you need to do and when you need to do it. So if any of that interests you, click that link below and get signed up for the Nomad Mentorship Bootcamp and we'll see you in our live video calls and in our community area. The next question is from Susan F and she says, what one thing about full-time travel would you like to change either personally or in general? I'll be honest with you, <laughs> Susan. I've talked about it before. I think the biggest thing that I would want to change is my van. I love my van. Don't get me wrong, but I do want more space in here. And when I saw that truck camper that my friends have, the host truck camper, I did fall in love with it. It's like a little apartment and it has everything that you want. You know, it has all of the, like the shower, it has floor space for me so that I can work out and do my stretches and exercises. It has space for people if they visit. The kitchen is bigger. It has a bigger refrigerator. You can take the camper off and on the truck. You could leave it on the truck. It doesn't matter, but yeah, it has a lot of really great options, so. Yeah, I kind of wish that was different for sure. The next question is from Intuitive and Inspired Art. How can you find out where you're allowed to sleep in your van in a city? Very great question. So a lot of times you just have to go onto the county's website or the city's website and you might look up, you know, sleeping in car city ordinance or street street parking city ordinance. So look up street parking. Typically you'll find it under street parking. And a lot of times they'll have zoned maps too that'll say like, you can park here, you can park there. And they sometimes will have some integration of whether you can overnight there or how long you can actually park there for. Um, it just really depends by county. So you might have to do a little digging to find it, but those are generally the words that I use to go find information like that. Some cities, I will tell you, have tried to outlaw sleeping in your van on a public street. Specifically, Southern California tried to do that, and that went to the appeals court, and they actually ruled it as unconstitutional on how to repeal that. Doesn't mean that other counties or cities won't do it, and it depends on how many people fight back. There's a huge homeless population in California, and that's the reason why there was a huge uproar about it. A lot of times, if you look on your iOverlander or Compendium app, and you go to find something to park overnight, over there people might have already said hey yeah you can park here but they'll give information also that states oh this has been closed already or hey a cop came over and told me you know I'm not supposed to park here there's a city ordinance against parking on the street or sleeping on the street and directed them to a different place so you'll see reviews like that so just go check your apps and see what they say too that's always helpful the last question for the day is where do you keep your garbage I know I'm going a little over here, but I wanna to get to this last question. So there are a lot of cities actually where homeowners too have to actually take their trash to the city like landfill or a transfer station that has trash dumpsters set up and also recycling dumpsters. So a lot of times we'll make use of that, especially like in places where we boondock because it's more rural towns, we tend to see a lot more of that. So it's like that in Leadville, Colorado. It was also like that in Quartzsite, Arizona. We would just take our trash to the transfer station. So it's really, really great system. And they don't actually charge for it, which is nice. Otherwise, if I can't find anything like that, I typically will throw it away. If I'm at a gas station, I use small bags. So like, you know, little shopping bags for my trash. So I'll go dump my trash in the gas station uh, trash bin, or if I find a trash dumpster that's okay for us to use, it doesn't have any restrictions on it to say that we can't use it, then I'll throw it in there as well. It's just one of the things with our system. I don't really have a way of per se paying to dump my trash, like people who have sticks and bricks because they open up account and they have a trash dumpster delivered to them and they put all their trash in there 
and someone comes and picks it up and so they pay for that. Uh, we on the other hand don't really have that ability. We're moving around a lot and so we have to find places that allow us to dump legally in their trash receptacles or like I said at the transfer stations. If I'm boondocking for a very long time, so let's say it's like weeks on end and I haven't gone into town yet, which does happen sometimes, I buy the really large trash bags, like the big kitchen trash bags, and then I'll put all of my little trash bags inside of that and then just put it up in like my front um, dashboard area because it's kind of out of the way and it's not, you know, back here getting in the way. I don't really want to keep it outside because animals and wildlife and stuff can get into it and it can also cause ants and you don't want that at all. So, yeah, you just want to keep it uh, nice and tight, bagged up, and put in the front dash or wherever you can in your RV until you can leave and go throw in the trash. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining me in this video, and I will see you in, well, tomorrow's video. It's daily videos on story chasing. All right, guys, good night.